My name is Lydia Hargrove, and I never thought I'd be the one holding my family together with duct tape and sheer willpower. But here I am, 31 years old, juggling a high-stakes career and a sister's wedding while our father spirals into a midlife crisis that threatens to derail everything. Lydia, do you think Dad will even remember to show up? Mona's voice cracks, her eyes pleading for reassurance. I squeeze her hand, forcing a smile. Of course he will. I'll make sure of it. The lie tastes bitter on my tongue, but I swallow it down. What else can I say? That our father, Randall Hargrove, is more likely to show up drunk with his new girlfriend than walk Mona down the aisle with any semblance of dignity. You're a terrible liar, Mona sighs, but there's a hint of a smile. But thanks for trying. We're sitting in a trendy bridal boutique, surrounded by tulle and sequins. Mona looks stunning in a fitted mermaid gown, but the worry lines creasing her forehead mar the effect. Hey, I say, standing up and smoothing out the skirt of her dress. This is your day. Let me worry about dad, okay? You focus on marrying that hunky fiancé of yours. Mona's cheeks flush. Ben's been so patient with all this family drama. I don't know how I got so lucky. Because you deserve it, I tell her firmly. Now, twirl for me one more time. I think this is the one. As Mona spins, my phone buzzes. Dad's name flashes on the screen, and my stomach drops. I step away, answering with a hushed, hello. Lydia, sweetheart. His voice is too loud, too cheerful. I can practically smell the whiskey through the phone. I need a tiny favor. I pinch the bridge of my nose. Dad, I'm with Mona. We're picking out her wedding dress. Remember? Oh, right, right, he slurs. Listen, Carmen and I are in a bit of a pickle. Could you wire us some cash? Just a couple grand to tide us over. The boutique suddenly feels too small, too warm. Dad, we've talked about this. I can't keep bailing you out. What happened to the money from selling the lake house? There's a long pause, then a woman's voice in the background. Carmen. My skin crawls at the sound of her throaty laugh. Never mind, pumpkin, Dad says quickly. We'll figure something out. Tell Mona I love her. The line goes dead before I can respond. I stare at the phone, a familiar mix of anger and helplessness churning in my gut. Everything okay? Mona calls from the dressing room. I plaster on another fake smile. Just work stuff. Nothing important. As I help Mona out of the dress, my mind races. How did we get here? A year ago, we were a normal, mostly functional family. Now, Dad's drinking has spiraled out of control. He's blown through his savings, and this Carmen woman has her claws in deep. Earth to Lydia. Mona waves a hand in front of my face. Where'd you go? I blink, focusing on her concerned expression. Sorry, just thinking about the guest list. Hey. Why don't we grab lunch? My treat. Over salads at a nearby cafe, I try to steer the conversation to happier topics, but Mona isn't easily distracted. You talked to dad, didn't you? She asks, pushing a cherry tomato around her plate. I hesitate, then nod. He says he loves you. Mona's eyes narrow. And what else? And nothing. I lie smoothly. He's excited for the wedding. Lydia. Mona's voice is soft but firm. You don't have to protect me. I'm not a kid anymore. I meet her gaze, seeing the strength there. Maybe it's time to stop shielding her from the ugly truth. He wanted money, I admit. Again. Mona's shoulders slump. For Carmen. Probably. I sigh. I don't know what her game is, but I'm going to find out. I promise you, Mona, I won't let them ruin your big day. As I say the words, a fierce determination settles over me. Whatever Carmen's up to, whatever hole Dad's dug himself into, I'll fix it. I have to. For Mona, for our family, and for the little girl inside me who still believes in happy endings. I slam my apartment door shut, kicking off my heels with a frustrated groan. The weight of the day, Mona's wedding dress fitting, Dad's drunken phone call, settles on my shoulders like a lead blanket. Rough day. Ethan's voice drifts from the kitchen, followed by the heavenly aroma of garlic and tomato sauce. You have no idea, I mutter, padding into the kitchen. Ethan stands at the stove, stirring a pot of pasta. He turns, pulling me into a warm embrace. 
Want to talk about it? He asks, pressing a kiss to my forehead. I sigh, melting into his arms for a moment before pulling away. I need to call Nina first. This Carmen situation is getting out of hand. Ethan nods, understanding in his eyes. I'll keep dinner warm. Take your time. I retreat to our bedroom, phone already in hand. Nina picks up on the second ring. Lydia, I was just about to call you. You're not going to believe what I found out about Carmen. My heart races. Spill it, Nina. What did you dig up? Remember how your dad met her at that charity gala? Well, it turns out she's made quite a habit of cozying up to wealthy older men at these events. I found three different aliases she's used in the past five years alone. I sink onto the bed, my suspicions confirmed. Go on. Each time, she gets involved with a man going through some kind of personal crisis, divorce, health scare, you name it. She worms her way in, gains their trust, and then... Nina pauses for dramatic effect. And then what? I prompt, impatient. She bleeds them dry, Lydia. Bank accounts drained, assets mysteriously transferred. One guy even lost his house. A chill runs down my spine. Oh, go, Nina. What are we going to do? We. Nina's voice is gentle. Lydia, I love you, but this is your family. You need to decide how to handle this. I close my eyes, fighting back tears. I know. I just, I don't know how to make dad see reason. He's so caught up in her. Maybe it's time for some tough love, Nina suggests. Confront him with the evidence. Make him face reality. And if he doesn't listen? I ask, voice barely above a whisper. Then you protect yourself and Mona. You can't set yourself on fire to keep him warm, Lydia. We talk for a few more minutes, strategizing and commiserating. By the time I hang up, a plan is forming in my mind. It's risky, but I have to try. I rejoin Ethan in the kitchen, the aroma of dinner momentarily distracting me from my worries. Everything okay? He asks, setting a plate of pasta in front of me. I shake my head. Not even close. But I think I know what I need to do. As we eat, I fill Ethan in on Nina's discoveries and my plan to confront Dad and Carmen. His brow furrows with concern. Are you sure that's safe? This woman sounds dangerous, Lydia. I don't have a choice, I insist. If I don't do something, she'll bleed Dad dry and probably break his heart in the process. Not to mention what it would do to Mona if he can't walk her down the aisle because he's penniless and drunk. Ethan reaches across the table, squeezing my hand. Okay, but I'm coming with you when you confront them. No arguments. I nod, grateful for his support. Tomorrow, I decide. We'll go to Dad's place tomorrow and lay it all out. That night, sleep eludes me. I toss and turn, imagining all the ways tomorrow could go wrong. What if Dad refuses to listen? What if Carmen lashes out? What if I'm too late and she's already taken everything? As dawn breaks, I rise, exhausted but determined. I dress carefully, armor for the battle ahead. Ethan and I drive to Dad's house in tense silence. We pull up to find Carmen's flashy sports car in the driveway. My stomach churns. Ready? Ethan asks, giving my hand a reassuring squeeze. I take a deep breath, stealing myself. As I'll ever be. We approach the front door, and I raise my hand to knock. This is it. The moment of truth. Whatever happens next will change everything, for better or worse. I knock. The door swings open, revealing my father's disheveled form. His eyes are bloodshot, his shirt wrinkled. The smell of stale alcohol wafts out. Lydia, he slurs, squinting against the morning light. What are you doing here? I steal myself, pushing past him into the house. We need to talk, Dad. All of us. Ethan follows close behind, his presence a comforting anchor. We make our way to the living room, where Carmen lounges on the couch, looking far too comfortable in my childhood home. Well, isn't this a surprise? She purrs, her eyes narrowing. To what do we owe the pleasure? I ignore her, focusing on my father. Dad, please sit down. There's something important we need to discuss. He sinks into his armchair, confusion etched across his face. What's going on, sweetheart? I take a deep breath, stealing myself for what's to come. It's about Carmen, Dad. 
She's not who you think she is. Carmen's laugh is sharp, cutting. Oh, honey, is this really necessary? Shut up, I snap, surprising even myself with a venom in my voice. I turn back to my father, softening my tone. Dad, we've found out some things about Carmen's past. She's done this before, getting close to vulnerable men, manipulating them, draining their bank accounts. My father's face clouds with anger. That's ridiculous. Carmen loves me. She would never dash. It's true. Ethan interjects, his voice calm and steady. We have proof, Mr. Hargrove. Multiple aliases, a trail of broken men and empty bank accounts. Carmen stands abruptly, her facade cracking. You don't know what you're talking about. Randall, don't listen to them. They're just jealous of what we have. I pull out a folder, hands shaking slightly. These are police reports, Dad. Bank statements. Carmen Santiago, Carmen Rodriguez, Carmen Vasquez, all the same woman, all with the same M.O. My father's face pales as he flips through the documents. Carmen's eyes dart between us, calculating her next move. Randall, baby, she coos, reaching for him. You know me. You know this can't be true. He jerks away from her touch, looking lost and small. I, I don't know what to believe. Believe your daughters, I plead. Think about Mona's wedding. Do you really want to show up drunk, or worse, not show up at all because this woman has bled you dry? At the mention of Mona, something shifts in my father's eyes. He looks up at Carmen, really seeing her for the first time. Is it true, he whispers. Carmen's mask slips, revealing a flash of cold fury before she composes herself. Of course not, darling. Your daughter is clearly troubled. Perhaps jealous that you've found happiness again after her mother dash. Don't you dare. I snarl, stepping towards her. Ethan's hand on my arm holds me back. My father stands slowly, his voice trembling. I think you should leave, Carmen. Randall, please, she starts, but he cuts her off. Now, get out of my house. For a moment, I think she might argue, but something in my father's face stops her. She grabs her purse, shooting me a venomous glare. You'll regret this, she hisses as she stalks past. The door slams behind her, leaving a heavy silence in its wake. My father collapses back into his chair, head in his hands. I've been such a fool, he mumbles. I kneel beside him my anger melting into concern. It's okay, Dad. She fooled a lot of people. The important thing is that she's gone now. He looks up at me, eyes brimming with tears. How can I ever make this right? With you, with Mona? I take his hand, squeezing gently. One day at a time, Dad. Starting with getting sober. Mona's wedding is in three weeks. Do you think you can do that? For her? He nods determination replacing the defeat in his eyes. I can. I will. I promise. As Ethan and I leave, I feel a mix of relief and trepidation. The immediate threat of Carmen is gone, but the real work of healing our family is just beginning. I can only hope that my father's resolve holds, that he'll be there for Mona on her big day. I look at Ethan, gratitude washing over me. Thank you, I whisper, for being here for everything. He pulls me close, kissing my forehead. Always, he promises. As we drive away, I allow myself a small glimmer of hope. Maybe, just maybe, we can put our family back together again. The morning of Mona's wedding dawns bright and clear, a stark contrast to the storm brewing in my chest. I stand in the bridal suite, helping my sister into her gown, praying that our father keeps his promise to stay sober. You look beautiful. I whisper, smoothing down Mona's veil. She meets my eyes in the mirror, anxiety clouding her features. Have you heard from Dad? I force a smile. He'll be here, Mona. I promise. The lie tastes bitter on my tongue, but I can't bear to shatter her hope. Not today. As if on cue, there's a commotion in the hallway. My heart sinks as I recognize my father's slurred voice. That's my little girl in there. I'm walking her down the aisle. I squeeze Mona's shoulders. Stay here. I'll handle this. Stepping into the hallway, I'm confronted by the sight of my father, disheveled and reeking of alcohol. Carmen hovers behind him, 
a predatory gleam in her eyes. Dad, I hiss, grabbing his arm. What are you doing? You promised. He blinks at me, confusion clouding his bloodshot eyes. Lydia, what's wrong? I'm here for the wedding. Carmen places a hand on his shoulder, her voice sickly sweet. See, Randall? I told you we'd make it on time. Eclair here. You need to leave. Now. Now, now, she purrs. Is that any way to treat your father's guest? Before I can respond, Ethan appears at my side. Mr. Hargrove, why don't we get you some coffee? Clear your head a bit before the ceremony. My father nods, allowing Ethan to lead him away. I turn to Carmen, fury boiling in my veins. I thought I made myself clear. You're not welcome here. She laughs, the sound grating on my nerves. Oh, sweetie, your father invited me. And unlike you, I actually care about his happiness. You care about his money? I spit. But that's over now. He knows what you are. A flicker of uncertainty crosses her face, quickly replaced by a sneer. We'll see about that. She saunters off, leaving me trembling with rage and fear. I take a deep breath, trying to center myself. I can't let this derail Mona's day. Returning to the bridal suite, I find Mona pacing, her veil askew. Lydia, what's going on? Is dad drunk? I hesitate, torn between honesty and protection. He's, he's having a rough morning, but Ethan's with him. We'll sort it out. Mona's face crumples. He promised Lydia. He promised he'd be here for me. I pull her into a hug, careful not to wrinkle her dress. I know, sweetie. I know. But hey, look at me. I cup her face in my hands. This is your day. You and Ben. Don't let anything take that away from you, okay? She nods, wiping away a stray tear. Okay. The next hour passes in a blur of last-minute preparations. I'm just helping Mona with her final touches when Nina bursts in. We have a problem, she pants. Your dad. He's insisting on giving a toast. Right now. In the lobby. My blood runs cold. What? No, the ceremony hasn't even started. I rush out, leaving Nina to comfort Mona. In the lobby, I find a small crowd gathered around my father, who's swaying slightly, champagne flute in hand. And now, he slurs, a toast to my beautiful daughter and her. What's his name again? Dad. I hiss, trying to take the glass from him. This isn't the time. He jerks away, sloshing champagne on his suit. Don't tell me what to do, Lydia. I'm still your father. From the corner of my eye, I see Carmen smirking, clearly enjoying the spectacle. Please, I beg, aware of the horrified onlookers. Let's just get you cleaned up before the ceremony. No, he shouts, his face flushing. I'm giving this toast now. To Mona and... And... Suddenly, he stumbles the glass slipping from his hand. It shatters on the marble floor, the sound echoing through the stunned silence. As I rush to steady him, I catch sight of Mona standing in the doorway, her face a mask of heartbreak and disappointment. In that moment, I realize that no matter how hard I've tried to hold everything together, some things are beyond repair. The perfect wedding day I'd envisioned for Mona is crumbling before my eyes, and I'm powerless to stop it. The day after Mona's wedding, I sit in my apartment, surrounded by the wreckage of what should have been a joyous occasion. Discarded flower arrangements and half-empty champagne bottles mock me from every surface. My phone buzzes incessantly, but I can't bring myself to answer. I know it's Mona, probably calling to tell me she's leaving for a honeymoon. How can I face her after what happened? The memory of Dad stumbling down the aisle, reeking of alcohol, plays on repeat in my mind. Mona's face, a mixture of heartbreak and resignation, as Ben's family whispered and pointed. And through it all, Carmen's smug smile, as if she'd orchestrated the whole disaster. A knock at the door startles me from my reverie. It's Ethan, concern etched on his face. Lydia, he says softly, pulling me into an embrace. You can't keep hiding in here. I bury my face in his chest, finally letting the tears flow. I failed them, Ethan. I promised Mona everything would be perfect, and instead... Hey! He pulls back, cupping my face. 
You did everything you could. This isn't your fault. But his words do little to ease the guilt gnawing at my insides. I move to the window, staring out at the city below. Have you talked to your dad? Ethan asks, joining me. I shake my head. I can't. Not yet. I'm afraid of what I might say. As if on cue, my phone rings again. This time, it's dad's number flashing on the screen. I hesitate, then answer. Lydia? His voice is rough, heavy with remorse. Sweetheart, I'm so sorry. I don't know what happened. I thought I could handle it. But dash. Stop. I cut him off, anger suddenly flaring. You promised, Dad. You looked me in the eye and swore you'd stay sober for Mona's wedding. Do you have any idea what you've done? There's a long pause. When he speaks again, his voice is small. I know I messed up. But Carmen, she dash. Don't you dare blame this on her. I snap, even though I know she played a part. This was your choice. Your weakness. Please, Lydia, he begs. I need help. I can't do this alone. For a moment, I'm tempted. The little girl in me wants to rush to his side, to fix everything. But then I remember Mona's tears, the ruined ceremony, the years of broken promises. I can't, Dad. I say, my voice breaking. I can't keep setting myself on fire to keep you warm. You need professional help. And until you get it, I... I need some space. I hang up before he can respond, my hands shaking. Ethan wraps an arm around me, steadying me. That was brave, he murmurs. A knock at the door interrupts us. I open it to find Mona standing there, still in her traveling clothes. Mona? I gasp. Aren't you supposed to be on your honeymoon? She steps inside, her face a mask of determination. We postponed it. I couldn't leave things like this. I brace myself for her anger, her disappointment. But instead, she pulls me into a fierce hug. I'm so sorry. I whisper into her hair. She pulls back, shaking her head. No, Lydia. I'm sorry. I've been relying on you to fix everything for so long. It wasn't fair. We move to the couch, Ethan quietly excusing himself to give us privacy. What are we going to do about Dad? Mona asks, her voice small. I take a deep breath, stealing myself. I think. I think we need to step back. Let him hit rock bottom, if that's what it takes. We can't keep enabling him. Mona nods slowly. And Carmen. I'm not done with her yet. I say, a newfound resolve settling over me. She knew exactly what she was doing, bringing alcohol to the wedding. I'm going to find out everything I can about her past, her schemes. And then I'm going to make sure she never hurts anyone again. Mona takes my hand, squeezing it tightly. We'll do it together. No more shouldering everything alone, okay? For the first time in days, I feel a glimmer of hope. The road ahead won't be easy, but with Mona by my side, I know we can face whatever comes our way. As we sit there, planning our next moves, I realize that sometimes family isn't about blind loyalty. Sometimes, it's about tough love, setting boundaries, and fighting for a better future, even if it means letting go of the past. The dim light of my laptop screen illuminates the scattered papers and empty coffee cups littering my dining room table. Nina sits across from me, her brow furrowed in concentration as she scrolls through another set of documents. Lydia, look at this, she says, turning the screen towards me. Carmen Santiago, arrested in 2015 for fraud and identity theft. Charges mysteriously dropped. I lean in, scanning the police report. How did she get away with it? Nina shrugs. Money talks. But look at the victim statement. It's eerily similar to what's happening with your dad. As I read, a chill runs down my spine. The parallels are undeniable. The charm, the manipulation, the gradual isolation from family and friends. We need to show this to dad, I say, my voice tight with urgency. Nina places a hand on my arm. Are you sure that's wise? He's still not returning your calls, and Carmen's got her claws in deep. I stand, pacing the room. I have to try. I can't just sit back and watch her destroy him like she did to these other men. Just then, my phone buzzes. It's a text from Mona. 911. Dad's in the hospital. Alcohol poisoning. My heart plummets. I have to go. 
I tell Nina, already grabbing my keys. At the hospital, I find Mona in the waiting room, her face pale and drawn. What happened? I ask, pulling her into a hug. I don't know, she sobs. The neighbor found him unconscious on the front lawn. Carmen was nowhere to be seen. Anger flares in my chest. Of course she wasn't. She got what she wanted and left him to die. A doctor approaches, clipboard in hand. Are you Randall Hargrove's daughters? We nod, bracing ourselves for the worst. Your father is stable, but he's not out of the woods yet. His blood alcohol level was dangerously high. Has he been under any unusual stress lately? Mona and I exchange a look. You could say that, I mutter. As we wait to see Dad, I fill Mona in on what Nina and I discovered. Her eyes widen with each revelation. We have to stop her, Mona says, her voice steely with determination. We will, I promise. But first, we need to focus on Dad. When we're finally allowed into his room, the sight of him, pale, tubes snaking from his arms, nearly breaks me. His eyes flutter open as we approach. My girls, he croaks, reaching for our hands. I'm so sorry. For everything. Show, Dad. Mona soothes. Just rest. But he shakes his head weakly. No, I need to say this. You were right about Carmen. She? She took everything. The house, the savings, even your mother's jewelry. Rage boils in my veins. We'll get it back, Dad. I promise. He squeezes my hand. No, Lydia. Let it go. I don't want you girls mixed up in this. I've caused enough pain. Dad. I start, but he cuts me off. Please. Just. Can you forgive me? The vulnerability in his eyes, so unlike the proud man I grew up with, breaks something loose inside me. Of course we forgive you, Mona says, her voice choked with emotion. As we sit with Dad, a plan begins to form in my mind. Carmen may think she's one, but she has no idea who she's dealing with. Outside the hospital room, I pull Mona aside. I need you to stay with Dad. There's something I have to do. She searches my face, understanding dawning in her eyes. Be careful, Lydia. Carmen's dangerous. I nod, a grim smile playing at my lips. So am I. As I drive to Dad's house, correction, Carmen's house now, I steel myself for the confrontation ahead. This ends today one way or another. I park across the street, watching as Carmen loads suitcases into her car. She's running, just as I suspected. Taking a deep breath, I step out of my car. Going somewhere, Carmen? I call out. She freezes, then slowly turns to face me. Her usual mask of charm slips, revealing the cold, calculating woman beneath. Lydia, she purrs, but I can't hear the tension in her voice. How's your father? Such a tragedy. I take a step closer, my voice low and dangerous. Cut the act. I know everything. And you're going to give it all back, or I swear to God, I'll make you regret the day you ever heard the name Hargrove. Carmen's eyes narrow, assessing me. For a moment, I see a flicker of fear. Then, she smiles, all teeth and no warmth. Oh, sweetheart, she says. You have no idea what you're up against. And just like that, I know, this is war. The morning sun filters through the blinds of Dad's hospital room, casting a warm glow on his pale face. I sit by his bedside, watching the steady rise and fall of his chest, a stark contrast to the chaos of the past few weeks. Lydia? His voice is weak, but his eyes are clearer than I've seen in months. What happened with Carmen? I take a deep breath, steeling myself for the conversation ahead. She's gone, Dad. For good this time. His brow furrows. What do you mean? I hesitate, unsure how much to reveal. But as I look at him, vulnerable, yet finally free from Carmen's influence, I decide he deserves the whole truth. After you were admitted, I confronted her. I begin, watching his reaction carefully. She was trying to leave town with everything she'd taken from you. But I wasn't about to let that happen. Dad's eyes widen. Lydia, you didn't. I didn't do anything illegal, I assure him quickly. 
But I did call in every favor I had. Remember my college roommate who became a detective? She was very interested in Carmen's history. I explained how we uncovered Carmen's long list of victims, how we tracked down her former aliases and connected the dots. Dad listens in stunned silence as I recount the final confrontation, Carmen's desperate attempts to flee, the arrival of the police, the look of defeat in her eyes as she was led away in handcuffs. Your mother's jewelry, he asks softly. I reach into my bag, pulling out a familiar velvet box. Right here, Dad. Along with the deed to the house and most of the money she took. It might take some time, but we'll get it all back. Tears well in his eyes as he takes the box with trembling hands. I don't deserve this. Any of it. After what I put you and Mona through. Dad. I interrupt gently. We've all made mistakes. What matters now is where we go from here. A knock at the door interrupts us. Mona enters, followed by Ethan and Nina. The room feels suddenly crowded, filled with a nervous energy. How are you feeling, Dad? Mona asks, taking his other hand. He looks between us, his gaze lingering on each face. Better than I have in a long time, he admits. And worse, knowing what I've done to this family. Mona and I exchange a glance. This is the moment we've been waiting for, a chance to start healing. We want to help you, Dad, Mona says softly. But we need to know you're serious about getting better. Dad nods, a determined set to his jaw. I am. I've already spoken to the doctor about rehab options. I know it won't be easy, but I'm ready to do the work. I feel a weight lift from my shoulders. It's not a guarantee, but it's a start. We're here for you, I tell him. But we need to set some boundaries. No more secrets, no more enabling. We face this together as a family. Dad squeezes our hands. I promise. No more running from my problems. No more letting you girls carry the burden. As we talk, outlining plans for Dad's recovery and the steps we'll take to rebuild our relationships, I feel a sense of cautious, hope blooming in my chest. It won't be easy. There are still wounds to heal, trust to rebuild. But for the first time in years, it feels like we're all on the same page. Later, as Ethan and I walk through the hospital parking lot, he pulls me close. I'm proud of you, he murmurs. The way you handled everything with Carmen, how you're supporting your dad. You're incredible, Lydia. I lean into him, suddenly exhausted. I couldn't have done it without you. Any of you. He kisses the top of my head. That's what family is for, the one you're born with and the one you choose. As we drive home, I reflect on the whirlwind of the past few weeks. The pain, the anger, the fear, it's all still there, simmering beneath the surface. But there's something else too, something I haven't felt in a long time. Hope. Tomorrow, we'll face new challenges. Dad's road to recovery, rebuilding our family's trust, dealing with the legal aftermath of Carmen's schemes. But for now, I allow myself to bask in this moment of peace. We've weathered the storm, and though the damage is extensive, I can see the first rays of sunlight breaking through the clouds. It's a new dawn for the Hargrove family, and I'm ready to face it head on. The late afternoon sun bathes Mona's backyard in a warm, golden light as I adjust the fairy lights strung between the trees. It's been six months since the wedding disaster, and we're finally celebrating Mona and Ben's marriage properly on our own terms surrounded by those who truly matter. I step back, surveying the scene. Ethan and Ben are at the grill, laughing over some shared joke. Nina arranges flowers on the tables, her artistic touch evident in every detail. And there, sitting in a chair near the rose bushes, is Dad. He looks different now, thinner, but with a clarity in his eyes I haven't seen in years. Ninety days sober and counting. It hasn't been easy, but he's fighting every day to be the father we always needed. Penny for your thoughts? Mona appears at my side, handing me a glass of sparkling cider. I smile, clinking my glass against hers, just thinking about how far we've come. She nods, her gaze drifting to Dad. Did you ever think we'd be here? After everything? Honestly? No, I admit, but I'm glad I was wrong. As if sensing our attention, Dad looks up and waves us over. We join him, settling into nearby chairs. 
My girls, he says, his voice thick with emotion. I don't know if I'll ever be able to fully express how sorry I am for everything I put you through, or how grateful I am that you've given me another chance. Mona reaches out, squeezing his hand. We're proud of you, Dad. We know it hasn't been easy. One day at a time, he says, the familiar mantra of his recovery. But having you both by my side makes all the difference. I feel a lump forming in my throat. We're here, Dad. Always. We sit in comfortable silence for a moment, watching as our loved ones mingle and laugh. It's not perfect. There are still wounds healing, trust being rebuilt. But it's real, and it's ours. As the evening progresses, we gather around the tables for dinner. Glasses are raised. Toasts are made. To Mona and Ben. To new beginnings. To family both blood and chosen. When it's my turn to speak, I stand, looking around at the faces of those I hold dear. A wise person once told me that family isn't just about blind loyalty. I begin. It's about tough love, setting boundaries, and fighting for a better future, even if it means letting go of the past. I meet Dad's gaze, seeing the mixture of pride and remorse in his eyes. These past months have taught me more about love, forgiveness, and resilience than I ever thought possible. We've been through hell and back, but we've emerged stronger. Not because we're perfect, but because we're committed to growing, to healing, to choosing each other every single day. I raise my glass to the Hargroves, past, present, and future. May we always remember that it's never too late for a new beginning. As cheers erupt around the table, I feel Ethan's arm slip around my waist. He presses a kiss to my temple. That was beautiful, he murmurs. Later, as the party winds down and guests begin to leave, I find myself alone on the porch swing. The night air is cool, filled with the scent of jasmine and the distant sound of crickets. Mona joins me, resting her head on my shoulder. Thank you, she says softly, for everything. I don't know how I would have gotten through all this without you. I wrap an arm around her. That's what big sisters are for. We sit in companionable silence, watching as Dad helps Ben and Ethan clean up. There's an ease to their interactions now, a sense of genuine connection that warms my heart. Do you think we'll be okay? Mona asks, her voice barely above a whisper. I consider her question, thinking of all we've endured and overcome. The pain, the betrayals, the long road to healing, but also the laughter, the support, the unwavering love that's seen us through. Yeah, I say, squeezing her shoulder. I think we will be. It won't always be easy, but we've got each other. And that's what matters most. As the last of the fairy lights twinkle out, I feel a sense of peace settle over me. Our family isn't perfect. It's messy, complicated, and still healing. But it's ours. And for the first time in a long time, I'm excited to see what the future holds. Because no matter what comes our way, I know we'll face it together, stronger, wiser, and more resilient than ever before.